I don't know of anything else that shapes your thinking more than the question, is there a God? Now obviously there are other questions that will follow if you answer in the affirmative, the question of which God and how do we know which one. But for now, I want to deal with the flip side of it. And the reason I deal with the flip side of it is because the atheists often assume that the theist is the only one that has to give all the answers, that they can just raise the questions. It's not true. They have to find some answers as well. I remember in the 1980s, during my graduate studies, in that period of time, 70s and 80s, spending endless hours reading the atheistic philosopher, Anthony Flew. We were taught to understand Flew, to read everything Flew had written, to get at the core of his argument, and somehow try to respond to the questions he was raising, whether the truth is knowable, whether the truth is verifiable, if language about truth and logic really has any reflection on reality, all these things. Little did I know that about 30 years later, he would renounce his atheism. So here I was in graduate school, studying flu, only to find out a year ago, flu has flown the coop. <laughs> he no longer considers atheism tenable. Now he's not yet come all the way, he's in the halfway mark of deism, and he also makes the comment very clearly that if there is a God, it would have to be the God of the Christian faith. And his studies on the writings of N.T. Wright and the resurrection, he goes on record as saying, this is the most persuasive thing I've read, combination of N.T. Wright and C.S. Lewis. I would never have known, reading in the 60s, the writings of Jean-Paul Sartre, that on his deathbed, the atheist existentialist philosopher, Sartre, would say he could no longer trust himself as an atheistic thinker because he found it didn't just fit together. One of the most hedonistic writers who ever lived was Oscar Wilde. I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Wilde and Jesus in a book I wrote called Sense and Sensuality, Jesus Talks to Oscar Wilde. I remember in my time of research, going into London and then into Paris, walking into the very church where his funeral was held. And interestingly enough, there wasn't a sound or a note of music in Oscar Wilde's funeral. This man was a hedonist, no music at his funeral. There's a little twist to it all. In the same church that Oscar Wilde had his funeral, in the back of the church hangs the jacket of Blaise Pascal, the French writer. And in that jacket was pinned the testimonial conversion of Pascal, where he described it in one word, fire. And here he was, having lived a life sensually driven, deliberately pleasurable, with no boundaries for him, brilliant in his writings. And he's lying in his bed, and he says to his lover, Robbie Ross, thinking of all of the exploits and the lives they'd plundered. And he says, Robbie, with any one of those little boys that you loved and I loved, did you love any one of them for their own sakes? Think of that. What a question. Did you love any one of them for their own sake? Robbie Ross says, no. He goes on to say, bring me a minister. For only Christ now is big enough to cleanse this heart of mine. You know, ladies and gentlemen, atheism has this tremendous attraction and seduction because it has the appearance of a world without boundaries. It has the scaffolding on which you can plant any kind of structure you want, only to find out it doesn't hold for the most important questions of your life. So in the time that I have tonight, and I'm going to race through some of this, I'm taking the first part of my talk here, and even though I said it tongue in cheek earlier, really, a subject like this doesn't do anything for my soul. It really doesn't. 
I'd sooner sit back at home and put my head on a cushion and get a little sleep. That might do something better for me. But you have to deal with these issues. It's almost the bane of my existence to have to drive a wedge into issues as Ray does and uh, Kirk does and some of the other speakers here. But it has to be done because you have to think your worldview through. And maybe there are some of you here tonight who have flirted with a secularized lifestyle, with a world without boundaries, and thought to yourself, maybe there is a greater attraction to all of this than the world that I actually live by and want to try my best to follow. I want to read for you an extensive passage. It is powerful if you follow every metaphor and see every hint of an idea here. It was written by a man who lived between 1844 and 1900. His name was Friedrich Nietzsche. He was one of the most brilliant German philosophers, a nihilistic philosopher, philosopher of meaninglessness. He had an influence on Adolf Hitler. Nietzsche's writings were taken by Hitler and presented personally to Stalin and Mussolini. He is the man who coined the phrase, God is dead. He is the one who talked about the supremacy of being the superman. A man who could pull himself up by his own metaphysical bootstraps. This is Nietzsche. The irony of it is Nietzsche's father was a pastor. Both of his grandfathers were in the ministry. And yet he renounced his faith in God. He believed intellectually it didn't come together. It didn't hold together. And so he wrote this parable. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, who ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I'm looking for God. I'm looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing together there, he excited considerable laughter. Have you lost him, said one. Did he lose his way like a child, said another. Maybe God is hiding. Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage or emigrated? Thus they shouted and shouted and laughed him to scorn. But the madman sprang into their midst and pierced them with his glances. Where is God, he cried. I'll tell you, we have killed him. You and I. We are all his murderers. But how were we able to do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? Notice the metaphors he's using here. How are we able to drink up a whole sea? How are we able to erase the horizon? You see, these are the demarcations of life. And so he's asking this. What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whether are we moving now? Away from all suns? Do you think we are now perpetually falling backwards and forwards and sidewards in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not suddenly become colder? Is not more and more night coming on us all the time? Must not lanterns have to be lit in the morning hours? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God's decomposed too, you know, and he is now dead. He remains dead. We have killed him. Now, how shall we, the murderer of all murderers, compose ourselves? Because that which was the holiest and mightiest of all that the world ever possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water can we purify ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What sacred games will we need to invent? Is this not too great a deed for us? Must we not now ourselves have to become God? Simply to seem worthy of it. There's never been a greater deed than this, you know. And whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed shall be part of a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent. And again regarded his listeners. They too were silent and they stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern to the ground and it broke and it went out. I come too early. My time has not yet come. 